Today, a board certified psychiatrist is going to explain what this new proposed mental health criteria actually looks like in our day to day life. It's one thing to say cognition, interpersonal relationships, and self-care, but what are some real-life tangible examples that we can grasp to? Doc, go ahead and take it away. All right. Yeah, great to be here, Clay. Um, I'm Dr. Prashant Sharma. I'm a board-certified psychiatrist. I'm an Air Force veteran as well. Uh, I deployed, so there's a lot that I understand that um, we as veterans go through. And um, I've been doing these independent medical opinions, which are also called nexus letters commonly uh, for the past couple of years. And I've been working with you as well um, in this collaboration. And uh, yeah, I, I've been working in this and just I, I look at mental health conditions and anything that's related to mental health conditions um, and, you know, things that are caused by mental health and things that mental health causes as well. All right. Awesome. So what we're really going to do is dive into the Federal Register of the proposed. In case no one's wondering, these changes are proposed. There was a lot of buzz that these changes were happening in June of 24. That's not going to happen. OK, my guess is next year. It's always been next year. But really, the VA can make these changes anytime they want to. I'm just estimating next year. So this is the Federal Register link, and we're going to have this pinned below in the comments. And what I what I really want to do is have Dr. Sharma, from his expertise, talk about the new proposed general rating formula for mental disorders. And to get everyone on the same page, Doc, what we have is we see these different levels. We have different levels of going from one, two, three, four. There's also a level zero. And then we have one or more domains. So the current rating schedule to me as a veteran just looks like someone vomited a bunch of symptoms and said 70, 50, 30. Um, this is more organized, almost in like an Excel worksheet format where we have levels, we have domains, and then veterans are going to be evaluated on each domain per level. Real quick, Doc, what are your initial thoughts looking at how mental health is rated right now, how it's been rated, and then the changes? Do you think they're favorable? Um, do you think it's more objective or organized? What is your psychiatry? Um, so what here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great question. Yeah. So I think I think big changes and I think overall <laughs> favorable. I think that it is more organized. Just like you said, it the, the way the rating system right now is, it's it's just a list of symptoms, right? And uh, a bunch of these symptoms fall in uh, 30%, 50%, 70%, so on. Um, but it's really unclear, right? Because one rater might rate somebody at 70% without suicidal ideation, but another rater will rate will not rate somebody at 70 percent um you know uh, unless they have it so it's it's very unclear and so this makes it a lot more organized i do think it's a little bit more objective with impairments as well um i still think there are a lot of subjective parts to this no matter what because mm -hmm. in inherently psychology psychiatry mental health uh, there are a lot of subjective components where the person has to just tell us, right? We we can't measure everything, but it's a lot more objective, um, which I can talk about more as we as we go through. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for that. It, it, it's really good uh, perspective just to see. You know, it's one thing for myself who's in a hotel room that makes YouTube videos about mental health. It's a whole nother level when we have a a psychiatrist actually talk about. Um, how the VA is proposed to rate mental health. So what we're going to do, Doc, now is instead of just hitting everything at once, we're kind of going to break it down into slices of pizza, right? The first slice is going to be the domain. So we have five domains. There's cognition. We have a second domain of interpersonal interactions and relationships. The third domain of task completion and life activities. Fourth is navigating environments. And five is self-care what I want to do, Doc, is not necessarily the psychiatry book definition of cognition because it's not bedtime for me yet, right? You <laughs> can go ahead and say that to me later. Um, that's weird, but whatever. <laughs> um, more of a practicality perspective, you know, a practical answer on in a, in a veteran's everyday life, what is cognition? What does that look like? What are some examples? And what the VA does here is they list some. 
like memory, concentration, attention, goal setting. But how, how does a veteran know they are impaired with cognition? Yeah. Uh, so with cognition, uh, there's a lot of different sort of sections to this. And then there's also like personal life versus work life as well. So, uh, so for instance, the things that I immediately think about, which I do ask about even now with the current rating criteria is uh, concentration on what you're uh, uh, receiving information wise, right? So you're getting information. So maybe a veteran is having trouble absorbing information that they're reading or listening to. So they read things and they have to read it multiple times before they're able to really comprehend it or absorb it. Uh, same thing with listening. So maybe they're in these conversations and they're not absorbing the information. Um, and that's usually, you know, they get feedback from their spouse or kids or, you know, <laughs> or other folks in their life. Um, and so that's, that's how it looks with sort of receiving and giving information. And that could be big in the workplace, right? Like if you're having to read policies and procedures, you're mm -hmm. having to read emails, um, you're having to absorb this information, maybe an instruction manual on operating some machinery. And same thing with giving information. If you're a supervisor, if you have to train coworkers, um, you know, how are you able to articulate? Do you have trouble with articulating concepts to other people? Do you have word finding difficulties, like where you, you have to kind of reach for certain uh, words that words that you just can't quite grasp? Um, so that that's on sort of the the uh, cognition. Um, oh, I mixed in a little bit of the criteria with that one, but, <laughs> but that that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do want to ask specifically on judgment and decision making. Is that like, um, uh, you know, the, the decision I make to grab my coffee cup and take a drink? Is it a life decision? I mean, what kind of judgments and decisions are we talking about? And, and what, what, what's the practical perspective and just a average veteran's life? Yeah. Yeah. So those, those decisions, uh, they're, uh, so first it comes with judgment, right? We can go into judgment first. It's like, you're receiving this information and now you have to make a judgment call about it. Now it could be something like you have uh, damage in your home and you need to make a, a judgment about uh, how you want to get it repaired. Right. And then, you know, the veteran might have difficulty making that decision. Right. So a lot of veterans will tell me, Oh, I've outsourced my decision making to somebody else in my family, you know, uh, uh, um, because I'm just not able to think through the pros and cons of this decision versus another one and make the right one. An another thing with that is um, uh, uh, is uh, uh, getting stuck on certain decisions. So that also happens where uh, in in a lot of anxiety and PTSD, people get stuck on certain ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. So that can also cause people to kind of freeze when trying to make decisions. As well. yeah. yeah. Remind me not to have my wife watch this because <laughs> I feel like she'll be like, uh, Hey, are you listening? Are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So that that's cognition and there is so much more to, to cognition, but that those are just some very, you know, everyday examples. I do want to move on to interpersonal interactions and relationships. And just from my perspective, I think my own opinion which means nothing. I think a lot of veterans, especially GWAT era, um, really struggle with interpersonal interactions and relationships. Um, and this is very near and dear to a ton of people, especially those with with children, you know, that have trouble connecting on an emotional level. Um, I assume that's what this is talking about, but can we get your your kind of psychiatry? So what on what is interpersonal interactions and relationships? What what impairments would, would come along with this uh, domain? Yeah. So I think you were talking about it really well. And and I agree, it's really common, especially in GWAT era. And basically, you know, you have different uh, uh, aspects of the interaction. So you have uh, irritability, right? That's a really common one where irritability really gets in the way of interactions with family members, friends, people at work. Um, having this sort of quick reaction to things, which is really common in PTSD and anxiety. So, you know, a veteran might be highly reactive. Their emotions are highly reactive in um, uh, conversations. And so this will damage relationships. Another thing is just motivation. Like so many veterans will tell me, uh, I, you know, I have these relationships, but 
I have no motivation or energy to like keep them going. So people reach out to me and I just don't respond to them. I never call back. I never text back, even though like theoretically I want to, but I just don't have it in me to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so there's like the, the motivation energy piece. There's also irritability and all of this, it, it, it's both in the personal life and in the work life that it can affect people. Is there a, um, I'm not trying to turn this into a counseling session. <laughs> Do you see kind of this roller coaster where a veteran could be really motivated and, and then, you know, for, for a specific time and then, and then something happens or it's just uh, so many things pile up that they kind of go in this really dark zone or dark area and they kind of just live there for X amount. Could be a day, could be months. I mean, um, and then, and then they kind of ride that roller coaster up and down. Is that common? Because I have a lot of friends that some days they're good friends and some days I could hit them in the face. You know, I'm just like, dude, what, 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 what's, what's going on? Is that, is it an either or situation? Is it both? Like, could a, could you be highly motivated one day and just really in the dumps the next based on uh, this domain? Is that, is that common? Do you see that in veterans a lot? Absolutely. You describe that like really well, like, like I would actually. So there's, there's mm -hmm. waxing and waning, they call it right of symptoms. Okay. And this happens a lot. Um, so for instance, with PTSD, um, you know, if somebody's having a lot of those intrusive memories, flashbacks, you know, dreams, things like that, what happens is, and this happens in the brain, right? Not to get too, you know, into that stuff, but, <laughs> but, uh, but basically the fight or flight center is too hyperactive and it drains energy from other parts of the brain. And so that that's what ends up causing issues on certain days where there you're so drained, you know, you, you have your cup of emotional reserve. Whereas if the mental health symptoms are not acting up, you know, you start the day with like 90% maybe or 80%. But when the mental health symptoms are active, you start the day with like 20% reserve. So at the end of the day, you just don't have any energy uh, to, to respond to people or engage with people. Um, and that goes for a lot of mental health conditions. Uh, another one is major depressive disorder. By nature, major depressive disorder is episodic. So it comes in episodes lasting weeks or months. And, mm -hmm. and so you'll see that roller coaster and up and down as well. Yeah. If my wife does watch this, now I'm telling her, hey, did you listen to that? Right? Maybe, maybe give me a break. <laughs> yeah. Cut okay. him some <laughs> All right. So that's that's interpersonal um, interactions and relationships. Let's move down to task completion and life activities. Um, can you just go ahead and, and take this one? Because for me, this is where it gets confusing. Like, are we talking about my ability to brush my teeth? Are we talking about my ability to go to work? My ability to you know, log on to StreamYard and send you the link. I mean, what, what is task completion and life activities? Is there a standard there? Like, is it, I, I really, I really have no idea. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think the answer is, uh, which is like not a satisfying answer. It's, it depends right on each, <laughs> on, on each veteran and, uh, and what they do. So with the brushing teeth that, that probably falls more under self-care, which we're going to talk about, but with everything else, I think you're absolutely right. So uh, task completion, let's start with personal life. So um, m as things as simple as, or we think as simple as mowing the lawn, right? Doing the dishes, doing the laundry, um, uh, getting the oil change in the car, uh, filling up the gas tank in the car. Uh, all these things that we think are like mundane things that we take for granted that we were able to do at times. Uh, that veteran might be having trouble with doing those things. And, and I think that relates to uh, motivation and energy. It goes back to that emotional reserve. Um, and then you have, so that's on the personal life, which there's a lot more examples to that, like picking up the kids at school, getting the kids ready in the morning, you know, when you're mm -hmm. trying to get out the door. And then you shift to the work part. And on the work side, uh, this is huge. So if, you're, if the veteran's going to school, uh, or if they're working or both. Uh, so getting uh, assignments completed on time uh, with, with their classes, um, getting tests completed on time in, in the amount of time they're allotted at work, like getting tasks completed and done. Uh, let's say you're assigned like uh, a project to do, but you're not able to do it on time. If you're noticing that 
uh, you know, you're you're doing the same task as your coworkers, but you're not able to get through it uh, like the other one, the other folks are. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's everything, and and I kind of put everything in there, but that's like vocational, so job, educational, they're mm -hmm. social, and then caregiving, which is like kids and stuff like that. So it, it kind of goes through everything there. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think if I don't mow the yard or pick up the kids, I can use that as an excuse with my wife, but uh, I'm going to try to one day. You know? <laughs> yeah. Hey, one sorry, the I left the kids at school. My bad. Uh, <laughs> okay. The fourth domain is navigating environments and like leaving the home, being confined, crowded spaces. Can you, can you just elaborate on navigating environments? Because this is one where I'm kind of drawing a blank as well. It's easy for me to look at the current criteria at 10, 30, 50, 70, and 100 and say, yep, there it is. But when it comes to this domain, it's like, I have no idea what it is. You know, go speak to your healthcare provider. So when it comes to navigating environments, what is it that you see from your, from your expertise? Yeah, it's a really good one. And I'm glad they addressed it. Um, and, you know, they went along with like World Health Organization kind of different domains. So, yeah. So first navigating, leaving the home. So you can start there. Right. So uh, some veterans will tell me, like, I just I just can't get myself organized and out the door. So that could start as early as like knowing like what clothes to wear. Right. Or, or matching the right clothes to wear. And then all the way to forgetting things at home. So I, I head out the door and then I have to come back because I forgot this or I have to come back because I forgot to lock the door or shut the garage or whatever. Um, and then you go into the uh, public uh, environments where, you know, a, a lot of folks feel that uh, that panic right in those mm -hmm. situations and crowded spaces where uh, veterans will feel like they are not able to escape uh, the situation that results maybe in a panic attack, right? Worst case scenario. Um, so uh, uh, one example I'll use is a lot of veterans will tell me uh, they go to the grocery store purposely at like 11 p.m. because there's less people there. And if they, the reason why they do that is when they've gone to the grocery store at other times, they've actually left their grocery cart right there with stuff in it because there were so many people around and they had to leave, right? So uh, things like that. Um, and then that takes us to also spatial. So which is on the current criteria, spatial disorientation, which now they're capturing here, which is, uh, I think driving and using public transportation. So, um, do you get so distracted by the mental health symptoms, usually anxiety that you miss turns or exits while driving? Uh, do you have trouble using public transportation, making the right connections, uh, uh getting to places on time to make the right connections there? Um, things like that. And, uh, yeah, that was a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I do have a specific question though, because oh. I kind of have trouble from my perspective, right? What is the difference between being situationally aware, right? So, so let's just, you know, full disclosure. Um, I, I have a concealed carry and I always conceal, especially if I'm out with my kids all the time. What is the difference between being situationally aware and obviously not the panic attack, but kind of, you know, a few tiers below that panic attack. How, how does someone or or is being situationally aware, is that involved in navigating your environment? I mean, what is the difference between just being aware and then having difficulty navigating that environment? Does that does that make sense? Is that? Oh, perfect sense. Yeah, it's such a good question because that's like that's yeah, that's exactly what we try to get into uh, during these evaluations. So it's fine to be situationally aware. That's what we're taught, right? In the military. And especially when we're deployed, it's like, all right, keep your head on a swivel, uh, like you like you do with your concealed carry and whatnot. But then w we, we try to see where it becomes problematic. So at what point does it take you out of the present moment and you're no longer there, right? So, yeah. yeah. So you're situationally aware, but maybe, you know, you're so... Uh, uh, focused on your environment that you're missing things happening with your family, right? Mm -hmm. And then that causes maybe the, you know, the kids or, or the spouse to get upset or, or maybe, you know, things like that. Um, that's when it becomes problematic. Uh, and I think that's what it boils down to. And then you said where it gets to the next level is more on the 
uh, physical symptoms like sweating, shortness of breath, panic, things like that. But, but really, I think it comes back to when you're taken out of the present moment and then you're not able to function in that environment like you were, you know, and that might be a restaurant, a grocery store, wherever you're at with the family. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to ask the following question about, uh, someone carrying and experiencing those physical symptoms and I've already brought it up. So now we might as well just go with that. Right. Um, I have my perspective on is that safe or not. I would like your perspective on someone who does, generally speaking, a lot of veterans conceal. If I had to take a wild guess and bet money on it, right? Um, is it safe to carry when you are, when you do cross that line into physical symptoms and we're past situational awareness? Would would you deem that safe? I don't think I would. If if I'm if I am being brought out of the moment especially on the panic attack side of the house, I, I would, I would probably not carry in that situation. Yeah. Um, do you have any it, comments on, and, and, and it's not really a psychiatry qu question. Just, um, I know people are going to ask because we, we did bring up the fact that, you know, veterans do carry and they do experience a ton of veterans experience these symptoms. I think it's worth at least talking about. Absolutely. No, it's, it's a really good question. And, uh, so yeah. Um, and, the, uh, you know, of course, not saying that anything should be done to anybody, of course. But um, I think that when there's a panic attack, and I think you're you're describing it really well, um, the, you know, the panic attacks that happen, we can't control it. It's like the mind takes over over the physiological, uh, 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 you know, aspects of the body. Mm -hmm. And so the danger there is not – so I, I do want to say – you know, with anxiety and panic, sometimes it makes you feel like you're going to lose it and like flip out. That's not the danger. That's just, that's just a fear in the mind. Okay. So nobody's going to flip out or whatever. I think the danger is, um, the decision-making during those times. So, mm. so like, let's say there is those, there are those panic symptoms. Um, and then what if there is something that the veteran perceives as a threat, but it's not a threat. Because in that moment, you, the reality is a little bit distorted because of those physical symptoms. Then the veteran might be reacting to the threat um, in in an in in an incorrect way, you know, pretty much. Absolutely, so, yeah, yeah. And then if somebody's shaking and tremulous with a firearm, right, and trying to aim it or something, that that's more on the physical side. But yeah, yeah, um, probably it's not a, good overall, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a tough thing. Uh, <clears throat> because that right is really important. Um, but then you have to try to balance it with the, the yeah. mental health symptoms. There's also prison too. So yeah, we, don't, true, we, don't want, we, don't, we don't want to go that route. Yes. We want to avoid that. <laughs> okay. So definitely doing an awkward transition from that conversation to self care. Um, the first video I did on the mental health proposals, what this immediately made me think of is like someone wearing pajamas to like a CMP exam. Um, but I know self-care is much more than that. Can you go ahead and just talk about what are some common, some commonalities within self-care of the veteran community who are submitting mental health claims? That's a, yeah, great question. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things where people think if somebody has problems with self-care that they're going to show up to that appointment, like in, in, in certain clothes or not shaving, that's, that's not true. I mean, it might be, it could be if it's that bad, but usually veterans, uh, when they have these problems with self-care, most of them, they will clean themselves up, right? We will clean ourselves up for like official appointments and things like that. That's where the medical evidence comes into play, where when you're talking with your treating psychiatrist or therapist or provider or whoever, that you talk about, hey, I just don't have the motivation to do these things, right, at home. And you know, I'm not taking a shower on time and my wife, my, my spouse is on me because of that, you know, and it's affecting our relationship. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to show up at the appointment, but it might. Um, so yeah, so that includes like brushing your teeth, like you were saying, uh, showering, dressing appropriately, uh, which is, you know, coming in the right attire uh, to events. Uh, but also dressing appropriately for the weather, you know, being organized enough to make the right decisions based on the weather uh, outside. Um, 
yeah, those those are some of the things. But again, I think just like you were saying before, it's a roller coaster. And so just because somebody comes into the CMP exam shave shaven uh, doesn't mean that they don't have any problems with self-care otherwise. What um, this is really a personal question for 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 myself. What is the self-care? What does that stem from? So so for instance, when I came back from Syria, I took about three showers, maybe four in Syria from January to August of 2017. And when I came back, I just didn't. I just, I just feel good not showering and I can't really explain that. Right. And I had this, um, the thing I remember most out of anything is if my nails were clean, then I felt clean. Right. Um, I know that's very weird, but that's just what it was. And so where, what, what does that stem from? Because that, that's my personal experience with self care. And that was in 2017, but that lasted, you know, I still have habits from that eight, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, where does the self-care, like when a person who's not a veteran is, is when, when, when they hear you're not taking a shower, it's like dirty, it's nasty. And so, which is a, which is a super natural, normal thing. Where does it stem from? When does a veteran get to the point where they're dirty, but they feel, but they feel good being dirty. And I, I really don't know how to phrase that in a better in a better manner. Um, I'm sure there is there is a way, but uh, can you go ahead and take that one? No, it was yeah, it was fra- phrased great, uh, and it's a it's like fascinating uh, question because I think it goes to like conditioning, right? So as humans, we're all prone to conditioning, and our behaviors are conditioned based on the the environment we're in and the circumstances. So for you, you were there in Syria. And you went through conditioning while you were there. And then you came back and it was difficult to get out of that conditioning. Now, you might be thinking, but doc, I was only there for not only, but compared to your whole life, uh, you were you were there for months uh, compared to your entire life. Well, that's because when you're in that situation, um, you have to remember that your fight or flight center, the amygdala is hyperactive, right? And so you're, you're, you're almost like, and the best way I can describe this, um, is you're, you're living much more time within that time is almost relative in that time. Uh, and I I know that's a little bit confusing, but conditioning gets into the person, into the human mind, much more easier in, in those situations. There's also comfort. So, which also sounds strange, but we do have comfort uh, when we go back to some of the behaviors that we were doing in those situations during the deployments and things like that. It's strange because you think, well, the deployment was a difficult time, was a traumatic time, uh, but that's where the mind kind of retreats to as a coping mechanism and strategy. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. but No, it does. It yeah, does. Yeah. You're almost not a counseling session. Okay. Yeah. Not a counseling session. All right. right. <laughs> okay. So those are the five domains. I think you did an excellent job um, describing them from, from your, from your, your psychiatry expertise. Now I want to go into the levels of each domain and just for, for everyone who's watching, the levels are the exact same for every single domain. Um, whether that's mild, moderate, severe, or total, you'll see the same levels of impairment for each domain. So we're going to start with cognition or we're going to stay on cognition and talk about mild. And there's a slight, you know, there's a definition for mild as it stands for cognition, but it is mediocre at best, right? Slight difficulties in one or more aspects of cognitive functioning that do not interfere with tasks, activities, or relationships. And then it's the same thing for moderate, severe, and total. My one question to you, and this is probably my biggest question of this, is it says mild impairment at any frequency or moderate impairment that occurs less than 25% of the time. What the heck is 25% of the time? Are we talking about a quarter of the day? Are we talking, you know, in a 24 hour period, um, in a, in a six hour period? What is that? Is it, is it that mathematical? Is it one out of four? So every time I drink my coffee cup, you know, one out of four times, I'm going to do something. What is 25%? That's that throws me for the biggest loop whenever I read the, uh, the new proposed criteria. 
Yeah, and and I think with this, they and and they really try to make it as objective as you can, right, in mental health. But this is where it still is subjective, right? So, so for for instance, even when you look at mild, like slight difficulties in one or more aspect, right, and you translate that, you know, I think that the clinician doing the evaluation is going to be responsible for really. Uh, translating that for that individual person, because it's going to depend, right? For one person, it's going to be something completely different than another veteran with like a different set of circumstances. That's where I think there's going to be some uh, some uh, uh, differences in evaluations, especially with like CMP examinations. Um, so, w which I can go into more examples on that, but absolutely, absolutely, yeah, okay. So for instance, like slight difficulties, so that, that could be just, you know, forgetting small things in the morning, right? When you're doing your routine. Um, but, and, and this could be something as small as, uh, uh, you know, packing the right things for work, right? But it's more like, you know, whatever you're packing uh, are more lifestyle things. It's not things that are critical, okay? Mm -hmm. so, um, so you're missing those things, but even though you're missing those things, it's not really having significant impacts on your life. You're still able to function. Um, so that would be like slight or mild. And then you you keep kind of grade, grade up from there. So when you go to moderate, you would step up to the, like the next level um, uh, of impairment where it is starting to have uh, pretty significant impacts on your personal or work functioning. And then it keeps going up from there, you know, but with the percentage, I think that's where they try to make it as objective as you can. Um, so that's a great question. So with the percentage, basically, it's it depends. So it depends on each person. So when when I'm I, I foresee myself when I'm doing these interviews, I'm gonna have to really ask like open endedly, you know, how this impacts them, and then I'm gonna be asking people to really try to nail down how much time it impacts them or days. So uh, one example is uh, a veteran might come back with to me and say, well, doc, I, I noticed that probably 10 days out of the month, uh, I am, uh, you know, not able to function or, or I have like really significant difficulties functioning. Uh, uh, I forget the, 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 the simplest things and the most crucial things in my life. And, and so that's 10 days out of the month on average. Um, and, and so then I'll use that to calculate the percentage pretty much. Right. And then determine like where it's at. Um, I know I'm answering that in a roundabout way, but that's because like, it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit nebulous still, and it's going to really depend on each veteran as well. Okay. Awesome. I think, yeah. I think you, from my perspective, the days out of a month seems more sense to me. Right. And then I also like how you broke down the mild, the moderate for cognition and this wasn't the plan, but I would like to just break down mild, moderate, severe, just very quick examples of each domain. So looking at interpersonal interactions and relationships, what would mild, moderate, severe in total look, look like in, in a, in a average veteran's life? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great question. So for instance, with these, we're on interpersonal, right? I think on this one. So, um, so with mild, it could be, Okay, there, you know, a veteran might be having some internal irritability, right? And it causes them to get a little bit annoyed at people, and uh, but but not significantly. They don't show it significantly, and it doesn't really impact their relationship. So they get a little bit irritated and annoyed with their spouse or with people at work, but they're still able to function. They're still taking care of the family, the kids. And at work, they're not having significant impacts uh, uh, to their uh, professional relationships, right? Um, and then you grade it up and you say, okay, then that irritability or that discomfort in, in situations is starting to become problematic and moderate where uh, all of a sudden they're starting to have some conflicts. So they're having some arguments, repetitive arguments with their spouse. Uh, they're getting, they're having these misunderstandings at work, uh, maybe you know, they feel like they're being targeted by people at work. Um, and uh, uh, that leads to some conflicts and that affects professional relationships and maybe even their promotability and things like that. 
Um, and then you keep kind of grading up from there and, and see like the more difficult it becomes severe. I would say, you know, that's severe enough that maybe it's causing some real, real difficulties in the relationship where maybe you have to go to counseling or, uh, uh, you know, uh, or things like that. Um, and then same thing on the work side where it's actually resulting in being written up or, you know, things like that. And then total would be, um, you know, if the, if it's so bad that relationships are suffering at such a level that they even end, you know, and, and, yeah. and it's impairing them completely. So a question, and this is not from, this is not a personal question. Okay. Just to, and that'll make sense once I ask it, <laughs> when it comes to medical evidence, um, which is always critical for any claim. I don't care what condition it is or, or how long you've had it. Medical evidence is absolutely critical. I also like to talk about evidence other than medical, because I think that kind of gets downplayed a lot, especially for mental health. Um, have you ever, or would you ever, let's say the veteran does suffer from irritability. They're on the severe total side of the house. Would that look like, you know, domestic violence, police reports? Would it look like breaking stuff in the house? Would like a lay statement from the spouse talking about any form of abuse, even if, even in its, it's, I don't want to, I don't want to invalidate abuse, right? But there are, there's physical and then there's verbal, right? And they're two very di different. What would statements and evidence other than medical would that be accounted for here during this domain? I mean, and same goes for all the other domains, but um, have you used evidence like that for your medical opinions or whenever you're completing DBQs? And do you see that coming in clutch for the new proposed mental health rating criteria? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I definitely use that information. Th there's multiple reasons for that. I, I think that supporting statements from the spouse, family, friends, you know, people who know you really well, the veteran really well, um, they're valuable because they give you that like third person perspective, you know, from the veteran, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, it's difficult to get all of that into the medical records because, you know, medical providers, they do their best, um, but they can't get everything into the record. So, you know, like if there's a long statement from the spouse or the spouse accompanies the veteran to the appointment and starts talking about this, some of it might get in there, but not all of it, you know, is, is going to be documented. So definitely having that I think is good. And then I, what I do is I incorporate it into my evidence analysis, which is mm -hmm. at, you know, sort of almost the top of my uh, opinion. And, um, and then I incorporate that. And there's also another side to this. People will sometimes get a supporting statement uh, from a supervisor or boss if they're supportive, you know, and, and they'll do that. And then another one, which is really powerful, but can be difficult to get is like employment documents, like a, a memorandum that was written up uh, uh, for the veteran uh, because of their, you know, uh, diminished performance or something, or, uh, or maybe time off there that they needed to take, uh, like official documentation like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Um, I want to go back to to our mild, moderate, just very quick examples of task completion and life activities. What would mild, moderate, severe, and total kind of look like from this perspective of the of the domain? Yeah, yeah, another good one. So, uh, yeah, and and this will depend. I'll just use some examples on it. But for instance, uh, maybe mild would be uh, the veteran is you know a little bit late with completing certain tasks, but they still complete it, right? And uh, maybe they have some internal discomfort, maybe they have to really reach in and, uh, 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 you know, get that energy from within to complete the tasks, but uh, they're, they're able to do it without any problem, right? Without any significant problem. Um, so that would be mild, and, and this could be something, things as simple as washing the dishes, doing the laundry. So the veteran would still be doing those things. It would just be what, as they're saying here, minor stress, um, or maybe they need extra time to complete those tasks, okay? Moderate, you would step up to the next level and say, okay, it's, it's really bad. Like I am just not able to find that energy uh, to, to do these tasks. And uh, you know, maybe the veteran is skipping the task altogether or they're getting, it to, getting to it uh, a few days later or the following week. 
um, because they're in that uh, episode of depression or phase of PTSD, uh, or maybe they require a lot of support. So uh, maybe during those episodes, it's that bad where they need accommodations. Uh, so their spouse or loved one doing those tasks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then severe, uh, we would go to uh, serious difficulties. And this is where it comes to where in severe, you're going to have multiple, like two or more aspects of task completion. So, which is, which really sounds like, what, what is that? Uh, so you're going to look at different aspects. So uh, uh, different categories, I think I, I can say, uh, of task completion. Um, so, uh, for instance, let's look at personal life, and then we'll look at work life as well, right? And and see where where the task completion is at there. Um, and and I think in severe, it would be significant. It would be really really bad, uh, where things are not being done. There's conflicts happening at home or at work. Um, and yeah, and, and then total would be uh, even worse than that. And again, it's it's sort of there. There is some like variation here, um, but yeah, that's what it would. Be. It it reminds me of how the current rating schedule for 100% is right now, where it kind of it implies the veteran can't work unless it's a very protected environment, right? Like working from home, working for yourself, um, examples like that. That's at least from my perspective, that's what it, that's what this, as far as you just described it, that's what this really makes me think of on the work side of the house is kind of getting at that 100% criteria for mental health, at least as it stands right now. Is Would, would that be, would, would you uh, support what I said or is that completely <laughs> wrong? I have no, no idea. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're a hundred percent right. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. I think that's where uh, it gets into that uh, uh, total impairment range. Um, and I, I like what you said in terms of uh, accommodations where, uh, you know, it, it's 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 basically at that level where, uh, like I was saying before, like without that support, they're just not able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it sort of implies they're not able to work um, at that level. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And two more two more domains and then we'll go go ahead and wrap it up here. I do have two last questions for you that I'm, I'm, I'm going to save till, till the end, though. Nice. But when it comes to navigating environments, let's go ahead and talk about mild, moderate, severe, and total um, when it comes to navigating that environment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we can go with like a particular example. So let's go with um, let's go with going out into public and crowds. Right. So that's a good one. So slight difficulty. So, you you know, you're going out into these crowds um, and public and you're uncomfortable, right? There's some discomfort there. You're a little bit more than situationally aware, but it's not significant. It doesn't interfere. You're still able to do your groceries. You're still able to be present, you know, things like that. But there is discomfort internally. You don't like it. It's not, it's not, it's not good. And then moderate is where it starts to bring you out of the moment where you start to get hyper-focused on the environment around you, um, and then that starts to uh, create problems, right? And so that starts to interfere where maybe you leave the grocery store uh, without getting all of your items, right? Or, uh, or you have significant like physical symptoms, right, while you're there. And then you keep going up where severe, where it's mm -hmm. even worse than that, where maybe it's culminating in a panic attack or near panic attack, and you're actually having to leave the grocery store altogether, um, or you're completely not present in in the in the uh, moment at all. Um, and then total, which goes even beyond there, where maybe you're you're just not able to leave the house, right? That's what I would see in total is where you're just not able to navigate outside of your environment at home, uh, the safe space. All right, and that's definitely when we get onto the severe side of the mental health, yeah. at least from from my, uh, my perspective here. And the last one, self-care, mild, moderate, um, you know, what, what, where does not sh showering, where would that fall in? And just small examples of the ability to care for yourself here. Yeah. Yeah. So mild would be, uh, so just slight difficulties. So, uh, maybe, you know, I, I should be, uh, shaving every three days, but instead I'm shaving every four or five days, you know, uh, just a random example, but uh, so it's, it's having some difficulties there, um, but it's not really inter inter interfering with anything. People are not really noticing. It's not impacting relationships. Um, 
I think that the the sh not showering um, that'll depend on the amount of time that's lapsing, uh, and that's where it'll get into this moderate period where, let's say, you're not showering for more than a day, specifically because of your mental health symptoms, like there's no motivation or energy to do those things, then it starts to become problematic, right? And the person is noticing uh, that it's interfering and their spouse is noticing and things like that. But it's still at a, a moderate level um, where, you know, they're not going for like a week, right? Without mm -hmm. showering. Um, but I think severe is when it starts to get into that where it becomes excessive and they need like intense uh, assistance uh, uh, and reminders to do that. Um, and then it's causing a lot of problems uh, in the relationships. Um, and then of course, total would be uh, complete total, which, which is rare, but uh, not able to do any aspects. Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say any aspects, not able to do uh, a certain aspect at all. So maybe showering uh, uh, at all and you need intense assistance for that. Could could this also be um, episodic as well? So so for instance, true story, and I'll leave some details out, but one of my friends, his girlfriend broke up with him and he was all about her. And I saw him a couple weeks after that had happened at the bar and he just looked like a whole new person, baggy clothes, kind of like athletic wear that was dirty, no shave, no hair, hair was all jacked up at the bar, just drinking his sorrows away, right? Like that type of attitude. Um, but then he cleaned himself up and got over it and what, like, uh, back to the question. <laughs> Can self-care be episodic as well? Where is, is it motivation based? I mean, what, what, what does that, cause it sounds really weird not to take a shower for a month, right? Um, can a veteran go from showering every day for a week to not showering at all? I mean, what, 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 what does that look like? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think most commonly it is episodic. I, 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 I very rarely run into anyone where, where, where they're just not showering for, for, months and months and, and it just doesn't change. I, I do think it's episodic and there's, there's those ups and downs, like you were saying. So, um, and I think that goes back to the mental illness because mental illness by nature, most of the time are episodic when it comes to significant symptoms. Um, so absolutely. So usually when I'm talking to folks, they'll be saying, they'll be talking about how, uh, they they'll go for a week, uh, with maybe only showering, you know, once or twice that week. And that becomes their episode of like severe depression, pretty much, you know, and uh, that's, that's how I look at it. So uh, long answer, but the short answer is yes, it's episodic. <laughs> okay. Yeah, most of the time. <laughs> Good. All right. So those are the domains and just for, for everyone's tr tracking, remember there's five domains and there's four levels of each, four levels of impairment for each domain. And each level is categorized by mild, moderate, severe, and total and how the VA determines the rating. And this is where we get to the objective side of the house is if you're level four in one, it's a hundred percent. If you're level three in two, it's also a hundred percent. And so, um, this isn't one of the last two questions I have. It just popped in my head. Um, could you see a veteran being for instance, a zero in self care or a zero in cognition, but a four in interpersonal, like, are they so overlapped where you're going to see high, if, if a veteran has a hundred percent, you would likely see threes and fours in each, or could it be like a four here or zero here? Like, could it be spread out? I mean, cause me personally, I would like to believe my self care is a zero. It's probably a one if I had to, you know, rate myself. Um, but I'm probably threes or fours. We won't really get into all that stuff here. Um, and some other, and some other domains, but that's really, you know, I think people, people hear about hundred percent mental health and you are, you can wear it on your sleeve, you know, I mean, people can see it. Um, I don't feel like that's the case with this rating criteria because you could be a zero in self-care. You could be a millionaire and really, really, um, the Marine Corps calls it white space, right? So in my life, when I have a lot of white space, that's when stuff goes down. Oh. So if I, if I stay busy, if I stay doing this and I, and that will portray to others, 
like I'm like I am perfectly okay, right? And so it really gets down to that. That's really the only real life example I I I, I can think of. And so can you see zeros and fours, or would it be like a hey, you have two and all belows or threes and twos or threes and fours i mean what 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 do you have to say to that yeah no it's that's a good one uh so i i think there i do looking at this criteria i do think there could be a scenario where there's like zeros um and then a four but i think that's going to be rare I think mm -hmm. most of the time when somebody when a veteran has this mental illness at this level it's going to be more spread out I, I honestly think just based on what I've seen and how, uh, you know, what veterans talk about, um, I, I think it's going to be spread out. I'm not saying it's impossible. Uh, there could be one domain that's just completely gone and then everything else is fine. But I think that's going to be rare because imagine like if somebody is totally impaired in one domain, my question would be, how are they not even mild or moderate or uh, 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 impaired in uh, another domain, uh, you know, because there are certain things that are shared uh, between the domains. And I know the VA talks about like not having overlapping symptoms, but no matter what, there's going to be some relations between these, uh, these all. So I, I think it's going to be spread out. Honestly. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Now, this is my, uh, my question I wanted to throw at you. And this one is a bit controversial. I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'll summarize it for you. But there is one sentence that really ties it all together. It talks about um, would consider ameliorating, which is basically, um, I'm sure you could give a better definition, but your symptoms are better, yeah. right? Yeah. After taking medication or treatment. So going through like cognitive based therapy or, or, you know, not just medications, there's other types of treatment. Um, and what the VA is basically saying here is that the VA will rate the veteran based on those better symptoms, not as they were without the medication or the treatment. And I have my initial thoughts on this. My first thought is I think this will backfire because veterans will see this and say, you know what? I have a financial need in my life. I'm no longer going to take my medication because of this claim. I think that's the wrong answer personally, but I, I can – it's going to happen. Okay. Um, and that's not good at all. That's my initial thought. And then my, 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 my question to you is really how would you determine or the psychiatry community determine veteran veteran symptoms actually being better due to the medication or the treatment versus just suppressing. Right. And so, mm. And I really don't, I really don't understand how it goes, but I would assume if I'm taking a medication that lowers some chemical in my body or my brain, once I'm off that, that's no longer suppressed. And so how, how you know, being, being treated is not being cured. And so my, my main question is, how would you determine the real symptom of the veteran who is on medication, who is doing tons of treatment and to get that proper rating, because I made a video on this the other day, and my fear is we'll see a lot of 10s and 30% for veterans who really have 50 and 70%, you know, criteria, but that medication subsidizes that, uh, that symptom that now the VA rates. I just want to get your thoughts on this. There's really no right answer. This is just a proposal, um, but this is my biggest, my biggest question mark of the proposal is this little paragraph here about medication and the VA rating those symptoms that are quote unquote better. So yeah. that was uh, a lot, but uh. <laughs> no, it's a great question. When I was reviewing this, like this one grabbed my attention as well, because um, I do worry about it, like from a philosophical perspective, because really like if so, all right. So let's say if, if I have PTSD and I'm taking these three medications and I'm doing cognitive behavioral therapy, man, like I I'm putting these chemicals in my body, wh which is, which is good. Like they can be very helpful, right? I I'm a psychiatrist. So I, I believe in it, but, but you are having to put these into your body to manage these symptoms. And then you are having to take time, a lot of time usually to go to therapy. Um, and that, you know, that takes time away from your personal life, from work, things like that. So philosophically, I, I worry about this now, uh, practically, I, I think that, um, what, what I'll, 
what I would do, so if this does go through, is saying, okay, so uh, since you started on medication, uh, what has been, you know, the trajectory of symptoms? So like, how has it been? Like, have you, ha have the symptoms gotten better? Uh, how have they gotten better? And what areas of your life have improved? And then, you know, trying to judge it based on that. But at the same time, I'm also going to take into account side effects from medication, right? Because there are side effects from these medications. Um, I'm also going to take into account um, the amount of time that it takes to go to therapy and how that also interferes with life, right? So a veteran might uh, have to go to cognitive behavioral therapy once a week, and they notice that they're like completely drained after that session because they have to talk about all these difficult things. And then for the rest of that day and maybe the following day, they're, they're not as functional as they used to be. So I'm going to be looking at everything at that point and seeing like how all of this has like sort of a domino effect on other things. If, if this, if, if they go with that, you know, pretty much. All right. So I'm glad, I'm glad you said it that way because that brings up um, another concern I have is would a CMP examiner who's generally speaking, not a psychiatrist. Okay. And we're just kind of, we're just kind of leave that at face value and not go into that. Would they, and this isn't, this is rhetorical, you know, would they consider exactly what you just said about effects of being drained, right? Cause I didn't even think of being drained until you had said it. And now, now I'm like, well, I don't think the nurse practitioner would be thinking about that. Right. Um, which is, which is a whole other problem in itself. Um, but that's, that's another concern I have. I'm hoping that, so the questions go through, this is proposed. They still have, they're going to make changes more than likely. Um, this will be the main thing that I'll be keeping my eye on. Um, but as far as the criteria goes and the mental health proposals as a whole, final thoughts, the floor is yours. What are your thoughts on the mental health criteria change? Yeah, so overall, I think, I think favorable. I think what you brought up just now is really important, the CMP examination thing. So, you know, in my, in my opinion, what do I know, right? I'm a, as a board certified psychiatrist. Um, I don't believe anybody can do a real comprehensive psychiatric or psychological evaluation in less than 45 minutes. Um, I truly believe that. And usually it takes longer, right? So usually I would say an hour is what you need for um, an evaluation. So I do worry about that with uh, the CMP examinations, which I, I'm not going to speak to the motivations or whatever, but if an examination is happening within 15 minutes or 10 minutes, I don't think that's going to be enough to capture this because I think this evaluation with the new rating system is actually more time consuming and, and more sort of difficult to conceptualize than the old system because the old system is just symptoms check 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 okay look at the chart okay you know that's it right with this there's a lot of thought involved in okay what's mild what's moderate what's severe and then what about the medications everything you were talking about like what are the uh ameliorating uh, effects like how are symptoms getting better things like that mm -hmm. um so i do worry about that like are they going to consider that or not um and that's really the main thing. And and again, the, the the new regs are good. I think overall they're favorable, but the question is gonna come back to the difference in evaluations between uh, what people have in the private world or in the VA and the CMP examination and how that's gonna be reconciled uh, is what I worry about. All right, well, yeah. thank, thank you <laughs> for taking the time out. Um, I definitely, definitely, definitely appreciate it. And last thing I'll say is we're doing a free Nexus giveaway from B Buck, a fan of the channel. All you have to do, and I'll link I'll link the video below in the pinned comments to follow that. And Dr. Sharma also has his mental health course. And how how I like to, and I'm I'm gonna pass you the buck for this one. But how I how I see your course is for those who really want to get serious about managing their symptoms and improve their life. That's really what it's for. Um, at least from, from a veteran's perspective, but doc, um, go ahead, take us away, talk about your course and that'll be in the, 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 the end of it. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank you, man. And, uh, thanks for having me and it's fantastic working with you on all of this stuff. So, yeah, so the course is, like you said, it's about treatment, you know, getting, 
uh, um, you know, the knowledge that you need as a veteran for PTSD and anxiety. Those are the main things. It can also be applied to depression uh, as well, but PTSD and anxiety. And really with it, I go through how we can understand um, th what happened to us in the military, how that manifests in our regular life, how those symptoms impact our relationships, our work, and then how we manage it and getting get it better. And the course, the the reason why I came up with it is so many veterans are telling me, uh, I don't know what's going on. Like I, I go mm -hmm. to these therapy appointments. I go to these other appointments. They're 15, 20 minutes, whatever. I don't understand it. And so I go through all that. I go through like where PTSD comes from, right? Like, why does it happen? You know, I do some self-disclosure as well, like about what I went through and, you know, what it caused for me and how I managed it. And I think that's helpful, at least veterans who've taken the course so far are really, you know, they, they've they given me good feedback on that because they feel like I'm able to understand, you know? And so um, that's what it's all about, really. And uh, there's sort of a, a, a bonus at the end, which is like, um, uh, it's something called ikigai, which is the Japanese term for uh, like purpose in life and uh, finding our purpose in life as veterans, uh, especially when we don't feel like we have that purpose and like how to cultivate it and, and get it better. So, yeah. That's what it awesome. is. Awesome. No yeah. one else, no one else is doing that for veterans doc. So thank you very much. Thank you oh, for yeah. everything for the last like year and a half that, that we've known each other. Um, crazy that I saw doc from a Facebook post and sent him a me me <laughs> message. And what do you know? Here we are now. So seriously, doc for everything. Thank you very much. Wish you and yours the best. And uh, thanks for coming out today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you as well, Clay.